Section 5 of Gentle Measures in the Management and Training of the Young. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gentle Measures in the Management and Training of the Young by Jacob Abbott. Section 5 Gentle Punishment of Disobedience, Part 2. Suppose one is not at the beginning. What has been said thus far relates obviously to cases where the mother is at the commencement of her work of training. This is the way to begin, but you cannot begin unless you are at the beginning. If your children are partly grown and you find that they are not under your command, the difficulty is much greater. The principles which should govern the management are the same, but they cannot be applied by means so gentle. The prison, it may be, must now be somewhat more real, the terms of imprisonment somewhat longer, and there may be cases of insubordination so decided as to require the offender to be carried to it by force on account of his refusal to go of his own accord and perhaps to be held there or even to be tied. Cases requiring treatment so decisive as this must be very rare with children under ten years of age, and when they do occur, the mother has reason to feel great self-condemnation, or at least great self-abasement, at finding that she has failed so entirely in the first great moral duty of the mother, which is to train her children's complete submission to her authority from the beginning. Children coming under new control. Sometimes, however, it happens that children are transferred from one charge to another, so that the one upon whom the duty of government devolves, perhaps only for a time, finds that the child or children put under his or her charge have been trained by previous mismanagement to habits of utter insubordination. I say trained to such habits for the practice of allowing children to gain their ends by any particular means is really training them to use of those means. Thus multitudes of children are taught to disobey and trained to habits of insubmission and insubordination by the means most effectually adapted to that end. Difficulties When under these circumstances the children come under a new charge, whether permanently or temporarily, the task of reforming of their characters is more delicate and difficult than where one can begin at the beginning. But the principles are the same and the success is equally certain. The difficulty is somewhat increased by the fact that the person thus provisionally in charge has often no natural authority over the child and the circumstances may moreover be such as to make it necessary to abstain carefully from any measures that would lead to difficulty or collision, to cries, complaints to the mother, or any of those other forms of commotion or annoyance which ungoverned children know so well how to employ in gaining their ends. The mother may be one of those weak-minded women who can never see anything unreasonable in the crying complaints made by their children against other people or she may be sick and it may be very important to avoid everything that could agitate or disturb her. George and Egbert This last was the case of George, a young man of seventeen, who came to spend some time at home after an absence of two years in the city. He found his mother sick and his little brother Egbert utterly insubordinate and unmanageable. The first thing I have to do said George to himself when he observed how things were, is to get command of Egbert. And as the first lesson, which he gave his little brother, illustrates well the principle of gentle but efficient punishment, I will give it here. Egbert was ten years of age. He was very fond of going a-fishing, but he was not allowed to go alone. His mother, very weak and facilitating about some things, was extremely decided about this. So Egbert had learned to submit to this restriction, as he would have done to all others if his mother had been equally decided in respect to all. The first thing Egbert thought of the next morning after his brother's return was that George might go a-fishing with him. "'I don't know,' replied George, in a hesitating and doubtful tone. "'I don't know whether it will do for me to go a-fishing with you. I don't know whether I can depend upon you always obeying me and doing as I say. Egbert made very positive promises 
and so it was decided to go. George took great interest in helping Egbert about his fishing tackle, and did all in his power in other ways to establish friendly relations with him, and at length they set out. They walked a little distance down what was in the winter a wood road, and they came to a place where two paths led in a wood. Either of them led to the river, but there was a brook to cross, and for one of these paths there was a bridge. There was none for the other. George said that they would take the former. Egbert, however, paid no regard to his direction, but saying simply, No, I'd rather go this way, walked off in the other path. I was afraid you would not obey me, said George, and then turned and followed Egbert into the forbidden path without making any further objection. Egbert concluded at once that he should find George as easily to be managed as he has found other people. The Disobedience When they came in sight of the brook, George saw that there was a narrow log across it in guise of a bridge. He called out to Egbert, who had gone on before him, not to go over the log until he came. But Egbert called back in reply that there was no danger, that he could go across alone and so went boldly over. George, on arriving at the brook and finding that the log was firm and strong, followed Egbert over it. I told you I could go across it, said Egbert. Yes, replied George. And you were right in that. You did cross it. The log is very steady. I think it makes quite a good bridge. Egbert said that he could hop across it on one foot, and George gave him leave to try, while he, George, held his fishing pole for him. George followed him over the log, and told him that he was very sorry to say it, but he found that they could not go a-fishing that day. Egbert wished to know the reason. George said it was a private reason, and he could not tell him then, but that he would tell him that evening after he had gone to bed. There was a story about it too, he said, that he would tell him at the same time. Egbert was curious to know what the reason could be for changing the plan, and also to hear the story. Still, he was extremely disappointed in having to lose his fishing, and very much disposed to be angry with George for not going on. It was, however, difficult to get very angry without knowing George's reason, and George, though he said that the reason was a good one, that it was a serious difficulty in the way of going a-fishing that day, which had only come to his knowledge since they left home, steadily persisted in declining to explain what the difficulty was until the evening, and began slowly to walk back toward the house. Egbert becomes sullen. Egbert then declared that at any rate he would not go home. If he could not go a-fishing, he would stay there in the woods. George readily fell in with this idea. Here is a nice place for me to sit down on this flat rock under the trees, said he, and I have got a book in my pocket. You can play about in the woods as long as you please. Perhaps you will see a squirrel. If you do, tell me and I will come and help you catch him. So saying, he took out his book and sat down under the trees and began to read. Egbert, after loitering around sullenly a few minutes, began to walk up the path and said that he was going home. George, however, soon succeeded in putting him in good humour again by talking with him in a friendly manner and without manifesting any signs of displeasure and also by playing with him on the way. He took care to keep on friendly terms with him all the afternoon, aiding him in his various undertakings and contributing to his amusement in every way as much as he could while he made no complaint and expressed no dissatisfaction with him in any way whatever. Final Disposition of the Case After Egbert had gone to bed and before he went to sleep, George made him a visit at his bedside, and after a little prayful frolic with him, to put him in a special good humour, said he would make his explanation. The reason why I had to give up the fishing expedition, he said, was I found that I could not depend upon your obeying me. Egbert, after a moment's pause, said that he did not disobey him, and when George reminded him of taking the path that he was forbidden to take, and of crossing the log bridge against orders, he said that that path led to the river by the shortest way, and that he knew the log was firm and steady, and that he could go over it without falling in. 
and so you thought you had good reasons for disobeying me, rejoined George. Yes, said Egbert triumphantly. That is just it, said George. You are willing to obey, except when you think you have good reasons for disobeying, and then you disobey. That's the way a great many boys do, and that reminds me of the story I was going to tell you. It's about some soldiers. George then told Egbert a long story about a colonel who sent a captain with a company of men on a secret expedition with specific orders, and the captain disobeyed the orders and crossed a stream with his force when he had been directed to remain on the hither side of it, thinking himself that it would be better to cross, and in consequence of it, he and all his force were captured by the enemy who were lying in ambush nearby as the colonel knew, though the captain did not know it. George concluded his story with some very forcible remarks, showing in a manner adapted to Egbert's state of mental development how essential it was to the character of a good soldier that he should obey implicitly all the commands of his superior without ever presuming to disregard them on the ground of seeing good reason for doing so. He then went on to relate another story of an officer on whom the general could rely for implicit and unhesitating obedience to all his commands, and who was sent on an important expedition with orders, the reasons for which he did not understand, but all of which he promptly obeyed, and thus brought the expedition to a successful conclusion. He made the story interesting to Egbert by narrating many details of a character adapted to Egbert's comprehension, and at the end drew a moral from it for his instruction. The moral. The moral was not, as some readers might perhaps anticipate, and as indeed many persons of less tact might have made it, that Egbert ought himself, as a boy, to obey those in authority over him. Instead of this, he closed by saying, And I advise you, if you grow up to be a man and ever become the general of an army, never to trust any captain or colonel with the charge of an important enterprise, unless they are men that know how to obey. Egbert answered very gravely that he was determined that he wouldn't. Soon after this, George bade him good night and went away. The next day he told Egbert not to be discouraged at his not having yet learned to obey. There are a great many boys older than you, he said, who have not learned this lesson, but you will learn in time. I can't go a-fishing with you or undertake any other great expeditions till I find I can trust you entirely to do exactly as I say in cases where I have a right to decide, but you will learn before long and then we can do a great many things together which we cannot do now. The Principles Illustrated Anyone who has any proper understanding of the workings of the juvenile mind will see that George, by managing Egbert on these principles, would in a short time acquire complete ascendancy over him, while the boy would very probably remain in relation to his mother as disobedient and insubordinate as ever. If the penalty annexed to the transgression is made as much as possible the necessary and natural consequence of it, and is insisted upon calmly, deliberately, and with inflexible decision, but without irritation, without reproaches, and almost without any indications even of displeasure, but is, on the contrary, lightened as much as possible by sympathy and kindness and by taking the most indulgent views and admitting the most palliating considerations in respect to the nature of the offence, the result will certainly be the establishment of the authority of the parent or guardian on a firm and permanent basis. There are a great many cases of this kind where a child with confirmed habits of insubordination comes under the charge of a person who is not responsible for the formation of these habits. Even the mother herself sometimes finds herself in substantially this position with her own children. As for example, when after some years of lax and inefficient government she becomes convinced that her management has been wrong and that it threatens to bring forth bitter fruits unless it is reformed. In these cases, although the work is somewhat more difficult, the principle on which success depends are the same. 
slight penalties, firmly, decisively, and invariably enforced, without violence, without scolding, without any manifestation of resentment or anger, and except in extreme cases, without even expressions of displeasure, constitute a system which, if carried out calmly, but with firmness and decision, will assuredly succeed. The real difficulty. The case would thus seem to be very simple and success very easy. But alas, this is far from the case. Nothing is required, it is true, but firmness, steadiness and decision. But unfortunately these are the very requisites which of all others it seems most difficult for mothers to command. They cannot govern their children because they cannot govern themselves. Still, if the mother possesses these qualities in any tolerable degree or is able to acquire them, this method of training her children to the habit of submitting implicitly to her authority by calmly and good-naturedly but firmly and invariably affixing some slight privation or penalty to every act of resistance to her will is the easiest to practice and will certainly be successful. It requires no ingenuity no skill, no contrivance, no thought, nothing but steady persistence in a simple routine. This was the first of three modes of action enumerated at the commencement of this discussion. There were two others named, which though requiring higher qualities in the mother than simple steadiness of purpose, will make the work far more easy and agreeable where these qualities are possessed. Some further consideration of the subject of punishment, with special reference to the light in which it is to be regarded in respect to its nature and its true mode of action, will occupy the next chapter. End of section 5